In this video, I'm going to show you how to recreate the Prodigal Son TV show poster. This video was recorded during a Creative Live TV stream. So this is a recording from that live stream. Hello everyone and welcome to Creative Live. I'm your host, Kenna Klosterman, and you, we are here at Creative Live TV. I'm super excited today uh, to have Jesus Ramirez, who is going to do one of his Copycat Wednesdays. Jesus, welcome, welcome to Creative Live. Hi, Kenna, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be back here with you. Last time we spoke was at the, during the podcast. Um, we That's are photographers, right. which, That's which right. came out about a month or two ago. I already forget. I don't even know I, what day it is. Time is a weird thing right yeah. now, Jesus. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's right. If you guys uh, didn't know, Creative Live has a podcast called We Are Photographers that I host, and I had Jesus on. Uh, so we had a lot of great feedback about yeah. your episode. So be Thank sure to you. check that out yeah. if you have not already, yeah. everyone. Well, Tell us a little bit about uh, Photoshop Training Channel and why you started Copycat Wednesday and what are the other things you do on the Photoshop Training Channel. Congratulations. Sure. You have more than 1 million subscribers, which is a huge accomplishment. So again, if you're not already, be sure to subscribe to the Photoshop Training Channel. Yeah. So as much as I like teaching Photoshop, I like to also work on projects. So I thought, what would be a good way of work on a project, but that also helps people learn how to do something in a fun way. And I'm a big fan of movies and TV and all sorts of things. And I always see graphics, whether it's a poster, an album cover, a book cover, or maybe just a style on, you know, on a certain TV show or movie. And I often do it for fun where I try to recreate it. And I thought, oh, wait, I could do something like this on my YouTube channel where I see something that I enjoy and recreate it so it serves two purposes. Um, it helps me just do something that I would do anyway, recreate something for fun, and also think of how someone could recreate it um, using Photoshop. Obviously, a lot of the movie posters, uh, book covers, and obviously TV shows, they don't necessarily use Photoshop to achieve a final effect, but the goal of Copycat Wednesday is to use Photoshop to achieve a final effect. So that's where the idea came about. Awesome. Well, we're excited to have folks be able to follow along uh, as well. Open up Photoshop. You're going to see a project, you know, from start, hopefully to finish <laughs> in, <laughs> in uh, this this time that we have here. I, Let's hit it. Over yeah, to you. Um, yeah. So we're in Photoshop and this is the image that we're going to start with. And the final image is this. It's similar to the Prodigal Son TV show. I've never seen it, so maybe you guys in the chat could let us know if it's any good or not, but <laughs> the poster's awesome. But I thought it would be a great thing to recreate for a Copycat Wednesday, so I'm going to do it live <laughs> with you here. Now, if you want to follow along with me, you can download these photos from Adobe Stock. All you need to do is just type in this number on the search, 302 one six zero four two one and it'll bring you to this page and you can download it the second image i'm using is this one the number is two nine one four one four nine two eight and again just type that number up in the search and it will come up and what you need to do is obviously get those images into photoshop and you will need to crop them i already gone ahead and crop the image out so that we could just save a little bit of time since i have a little under an hour to um, recreate this effect. So the first thing that I'm going to do is start making a selection around the main subject, which is this uh, gentleman here. And in latest, in the latest release of Photoshop, you now have something called Adobe Sensei, which is Adobe's artificial intelligence. It uses machine learning technology to find the edges of things and make a selection. So instead of wasting my time with the quick selection tool and clicking and dragging, all I'm going to do is go into select and click on subject. And that will just make a selection out of the person here. And I actually don't want to use a layer mask. I would rather use a vector mask for this effect just to give me a little more flexibility with the editing. I'm only using the selection as a reference so that Photoshop could generate a vector mask for me. It's not gonna be perfect, but it's gonna be a lot faster than starting from scratch. So with that selection active, what I'm gonna do is go into the path panel. And from here, you'll see this little icon here at the bottom, this make work path icon. Don't click on it, just um, actually click, the first time click on it so you can see how it generates the path. 
when you are working with vector mask, you usually want to have the fewest amount of uh, points as possible, these little dots. So you want to be able to make that shape with a fewer amount of points. So if you create a vector mask and it has a whole bunch of points or a path, rather, it's not a vector mask yet, um, what you need to do is hold Alt on Windows, Option in the Mac, and click on that vector path um, icon, make work path icon, and then just increase the number. The lower the number, the more points you'll get, the higher the number, the fewer points you'll get. So in this case, I'll try six, press OK, and that looks pretty good. Again, it's not perfect, but it already got us pretty far into the, the work here. So with this layer active, um, all I'm going to do, first of all, I'm going to duplicate it because I need another version of that layer. So with the duplicate layer active, I'm going to hold Control on Windows, Command on the Mac, and click on the new layer mask icon to create a vector mask. So see, he doesn't have a background anymore. And the reason that I'm using, a, again, a vector mask is so that I can have more control when I make adjustments. And you'll see why in a moment. So with the vector mask selected, you could also use the curvature pen tool. Hold Control on Windows, Command on the Mac, and click on the path. And you can just click and drag these points to adjust them. See that? Adjust these points any way that you want, like so. And then just obviously spend some, spend some time fine-tuning the edges of your mask. If for whatever reason the subject that you're selecting has blurry edges, maybe there's some sort of depth of field going on in the photo, you can increase the feather in the properties panel, like so, to blur the edges of that mask. And it still keeps it editable, but in this case, I'm just going to keep it razor sharp. And this is just the main image here. What I'm going to do now is um, go into the background because I want a clean plate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to load this as a selection. So I'm going to hold Control on Windows, Command on the Mac, and click on the vector mask icon to load it as a selection. I want to make sure that it catches everything. So you see how there's some hairs here. Part of his shirt's not really selected. So I'm just going to go into Modify, Expand, and just expand it by like 10 pixels. We'll see how that works. Maybe even another 10 pixels. And just make sure that everything is selected. And if you still don't have it, use the lasso tool. Hold Shift, click, and drag to add to the selection like so. And I'm sorry, I'm going, I know I'm going super fast, but I want to try to show you guys all the steps. This is recorded. If you have any questions, leave them in the chat. Kenna will ask me. And, uh, but yeah, I'm going pretty quickly because I want to show you just as much as I can instead of just spending time fine tuning things that don't really matter. But anyway, with this um, original background active, I'm going to click and drag it into the new layer icon to duplicate it. And then I'm going to go into uh, edit content aware fill. Content aware fill is this really cool technology that allows you to look at an image and then Photoshop generates pixels based on the pixels around it. So in this case, we were able to remove the person like that, and it looks really, really good. I'm just going to press OK, and now I have basically an empty background. And it's not perfect. You can see that I missed a couple areas here and another one here, but that's OK. That may or may affect the composite later on. I'm not sure. So just to avoid problems later on, I'm going to select those two layers, press Control e Command-E on the Mac, and I'm probably not going to name all the layers now to save time, but I do have a habit of naming my my uh, my layers. So I'll call this one clean background. And now that it's one single layer, what I can do is just go into the patch tool, click and drag, and make a selection like so, and then just click and drag and sample from another area. This really doesn't bother me because his body will be covering it, so we don't need to worry about it. Cool. So now I have a clean background and him in one layer. What I'm going to do now is um, work on creating those ribbons on his face. So if we look at the final image, you can see how it's basically a ribbon going over his eyes, over his mouth, and then like the caps of his head just popping out. So how do we achieve that effect? Well, the, the first thing that you need to do is with um, a layer that is not anything that has a vector path in it, just like a regular layer, select the curvature pen tool, and then you can spend some time, you know, creating your mask like so. And obviously I'm going fairly quickly here. 
Again, I'm using the curvature pen tool, not the pen tool. The reason that I like the curvature pen tool better is because it's easier to edit. See how I can just click and drag on these points. And if I want to create a sharp corner, I can double click. It makes a sharp corner. If I want to add a point in between two uh, vector points, I can add one and click and drag. So it, it's really, really useful to edit a vector path. So I enjoy it a lot. Um, if you also something that you can do with the curvature pen tool that you can't do with the other tools is that if you select the point and you um, hit the delete key or the backspace key, it removes that point without breaking the path. If I were to do the same thing with the direct selection tool, see how I have the direct selection tool active and I can edit the path with that point active. If I hit backspace, it breaks that connection. See that? So that's why I don't like uh, using the white arrow tool, the direct selection tool to make those adjustments. But anyway, so now that you have your selection active, what I'm going to do is create a new layer and I'm going to bring this up above him. And then with that mask, I could also do the same thing. Control Alt on Windows, Command Option, uh, Option Delete on the Mac and see I have my top part, right? So then I could come in here and again, I'm going super quickly here. I could come in here and now do the other part like this part here, like so make my selection, spend your time fine tuning it, of course. And there it is. So see that I have now that part. Pretty cool. And then I can do one more down here. And again, sorry guys for the speed, but now I have another part. Pretty cool. And the original mask, notice that we have his face still. We don't want his face to show up. So we want his face to be hidden. So what you can do is just select a bunch of these, these paths and then just delete them. And I know it'll break the, the path like I mentioned earlier, but then you can just come in and, and with the curvature pen tool and click on both points and it'll join them again. And what you can do is just make sure that, you know, you have the face right around there. And when you enable the other parts, that's more or less the result that you'll get. Now, I know I went super fast, but I already planned in advance and I have a, a file where I'm pretty much at that same spot with nicer curves. So I didn't do anything that I didn't show. All I did is took my time to get it more accurate. But as you can see, that's basically where, <laughs> where we were. So I put the, everything into a group. I have a background group and I have the, the face here like so. So see the head, just like I had it there and then just the, the bottom part there. Cool. So that's the magic of television, like in the cooking shows, you know, when they pull out like a pizza from the oven and it's already cooked. That's basically what we're doing here. So let me not save this and um, we'll continue. So now that we have the shapes created, the next thing that we need to do is bring in the second face, you know, because it's really two people. It's not the same person. You can actually do it with the same image if you want. If you're using your own images, you can do like a selfie up against the white wall and then do everything I did here and just duplicate that same face and put it inside the other. But in, in the original TV show poster and how I'm going to do it today um, is with two people. So you can use two photos or one photo of the same person. It's totally up to you. But what I need to do is just bring that photo in. And the photo is of this guy in a similar position, obviously. Create a selection like so. Create a layer mask and then convert that into a smart object. And when I drag it into a new document, I only get the face, not the rest of the body. So we don't need to worry about all those other pixels. And if you need those pixels, remember, this is a smart object. So let me see where it went. Let me just drag him out here. He doesn't need to be in that group. So basically what that means is you can double click on the layer thumbnail and it's there and watch this. If I unlink it, I can move it around and the rest of his body still there. So we didn't really lose it. It's just saved and hidden. But when we're working on the main document, we don't have to worry about that giant picture. We just worry about the cropped area. So I'm going to put him right here, right in between that group. And actually, let me show you a trick. Sometimes when you're working, especially with like, a, I have my Wacom tablet like right here. I'm not using it now, and but I'm using a mouse. And sometimes if your, walk, your hand is too um, shaky and you're using a Wacom tablet and you're trying to drag it in between two layers, you might accidentally drop it into a group and it just gets annoying. So what you can do is use uh, the control key on Windows, the command key on the Mac, and click on the bracket keys. Those are right next to the letter P in North American keyboards. See how it just goes down and up? So command, control, and then use the bracket key. So I can just 
move it down in between where it needs to go. So what I'll do now is I will place, uh, you need to find a reference point. And in this case, I think the best reference point is like right here, right under his uh, chin. And what I can do is press Control T, Command T in the Mac. If you're working in Photoshop 2020 or newer, if you're watching this in the future, um, you will need to enable the, I call it the pivot point, but the technical term is a reference point. Call it however you like. The point is, is that this little, little dot here is disabled. I don't know why Adobe decided to just disable it in the newest version of Photoshop, but that is unchecked. So you can't see it. So if you click on this icon, it comes back and I can click and drag it right here. And what that does is that makes it so that I can rotate using that reference point if I hold the Alt key on Windows, the Option key in the Mac, and it rotates from that point, or I can scale to that point. See that? See how I can scale to that point? So let me just press Escape because I didn't really want to rotate it, and I'll do that again. So I'm just going to use this part here as the reference point, and I'm going to click and drag down like so, and you can decide how big it needs to be. Maybe something like this would work. And click on the check mark to commit the changes. So now what we'll do is we'll mask him out. He doesn't have a mask yet, but we'll use exactly the same technique. Select subject, Adobe Sensei will find the edges. Looks fantastic. I can go into the paths panel. Again, just click on this icon. It'll create a vector path. From the layers panel, I can hold control, command on the Mac and click on the new layer icon and boom, we have a vector mask. Super, super cool. There we go. See, you know, we're almost almost there. <laughs> let me see what the next file is because I forgot. Uh, let me see what I did here. OK, cool. So basically, that's that's where I'm going. I want to work on the file that I really spend time on. So I'm kind of going in steps here. If your image works perfect at this point, just stop and don't do this next step. If you want to have a little more control, what you can do is duplicate this layer like two more times, right? I'm clicking and dragging into a new layer icon, but you could also press Control J on Windows, Command J on the Mac. And, you know, like we'll just work on this first one, right, on top. Make sure that the vector path is selected, the vector mask, I should say. And then with the curvature pen tool, just come and make a, oop, make sure I'm in the right area there. Just come and make a selection like so. And then on this drop down, make sure you select intersect shapes and see how it just kept the top part. And then I'll do the same thing here. Go into this, this shape here, make sure that the vector mask is active and I'll keep this bottom part here, his eyes, the guy in the back. See that, just come back around like so. The key for this is to have intersect shape areas active. And then boom, we're gonna do that one more time here at the bottom and we're just gonna do this super quickly. See, I'm going quickly enough, you know, like I'm still doing a decent job. So you guys could spend some time. Actually, I'm, see, I, I said that and I made a mistake. So, <laughs> so since I made a mistake, what I'll do is I'll just undo, see, because I didn't do what I told you guys to do earlier, which is click on the vector mask. So you need to have your vector mask active. So the blue lines need to show and then it'll work. See, if I was just doing a regular Copycat Wednesday, not doing it live here with you guys, I would have just gone back and edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so now, now that I have all these shapes here, see, it makes up the image. But the reason that I separated them is now I can control them, right? Maybe I can go a little bit higher. See that? I can go a little bit higher on this one. This one, maybe go a little bit lower. You know, you have total control of how you place your images. See that? Super, super cool. So I think that's where I'm at over here. Yeah. Actually, look, it's not too, not too different. Um, I actually kind of like the one I did here better, but the other one's already like ready to go. So I'll close this one and we'll just continue working with this one. So the one thing that um, I really didn't talk about, and that was probably because I was going a little fast, but before I move on into the next step, I really wanted to show you the reason why I used a vector path as opposed to a regular layer masks. And some of you may be thinking, well, you know, layer mask is easier to make. Yeah, it's easier to make, but the reason that I did it was so that I could adjust it, right? So now that I have my composite here, if I wanted to, I could come back in there and hold, uh, I selected the curvature pen tool, hold control, command on the Mac, click on the path and see how I can adjust, I can adjust it. So maybe I want to hide the hair. I could come in here and just give it a different type of curvature, you know? So you have total control over how you adjust the path, right? So you can just keep adjusting it any way that you want. 
like so. So that's the reason why we're using a vector path as opposed to a layer mask. It just keeps things editable. They're sharp edges. So um, I just remember that I didn't mention that earlier and I wanted to point it out before we got to the step. So now that we have this, all we need to do is create the illusion that these caps have a 3D depth to them. So we're just going to fake that. And the way that we're going to fake it is by going into from this behind face group, that face that we just worked on just a moment ago, go into the pen tool and we can create a path that just sort of makes it seem as if it's just filling in. See that that path there? And I can maybe click and drag here to rotate it. And I'm not using the curvature pen tool, which is why I made that little weird turn. So maybe something like this. And then I can go into the solid color fill layer and it fills with a color. What color should we select? We can select the shadow, like just use some of the skin tones that are already found in the image. Just find the shadow that you think you'll like for the inside of the head. So maybe something like that. Press OK. And now I can either, you can do two things. If you really want to have total control, just click on the group, uh, something that is not a vector layer, and then do the same thing on this side here, like so. And then do the same thing, solid color, and press OK. Make sure that that's under the main face and also that it's under the face behind the guy. So now it just creates that illusion that there's something back here. See that? And actually, this one has a darker color. So let me just select this one there. Just try to make all the colors the same so that when you start adding shadows, it's, it's easier. And you would just re repeat this same process with these shapes here, same process. So just to save a little time, I guess I'll do one more just to show you guys. So what you need to do is, again, click on anything that is not a vector layer. In this case, the group. I'll click on the background group. That way it creates it on the layer above. And then just think about how it would look if it was actually like a ribbon coming around and you see the inside of it. And then create a solid color fill layer. Use the same color as before. Press OK. And there it is. It just looks like there's a ribbon going in. And actually, if you really wanted to, um, you could just make a, um, a shape here instead of a path. And then you could start doing your shape. And then it just applies the color right away without going into the solid color, solid color fill layer. If you're wondering why I didn't do that from the beginning is because I was too lazy to go into the <laughs> options bar and change it over to shape. But that's another way of doing it. As you guys know, in Photoshop, there's a lot of ways of doing the same thing, but there you go, same same difference. So let me just open up the file where I had finished those inside shapes. And if you notice in this new document here, same thing I did with you guys there. There's those shapes right there, see that? And I called the group inside shapes, like so. And if you're wondering why I didn't do one in this year, it's because I was really trying to be true to the original and the way the perspective matches in the original, you couldn't really see the top or bottom. Uh, this is not really a perspective class, but if you think about how there's a horizon line, right? Your eye level. And if, if something is at, at, right at your eye level, like the camera I'm looking into, I can't see the top or the bottom of the camera because it's at eye level, but I can see the, the bottom part of the things above there and I can see the top parts of the thing below. So that's kind of how you have to think when you're compositing these things. You have to think of the perspective and the camera and all that. But that's the reason why. In this case, I wasn't paying too much, paying too much attention to the perspective. So some of these things may not be 100% in the uh, right perspective, but that's the reason why I didn't do it in case you're wondering. Um, but anyway, so now that we're in this step, what we need to do is add some shadows into the image. Um, and actually, just so I know how fast or how slow to go, Kenna, how much time do we have? Do you know? Yeah, we still were only at 3.30, so you're good. Oh, perfect. I can yeah. slow down. <laughs> I was, you got plenty of time. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Perfect. Um, what I'm going to do now is with these shapes and also the um, behind face, we're going to add some shadows. And what I'm going to do is just create a new layer, call it shadows. And I'll clip it to the layer below. Control Alt G, Command Option G in the Mac. A clipping mask or clipping a layer simply means that the layer below is going to control the visibility of the layer on top. So since I clipped 
this shadows layer to this behind face group, that means that when I paint, I'm only going to paint on that face, right? And this is probably easier or not easier. It's probably, you'll probably get better results if you have a Wacom tablet. But when I present, I feel so uncomfortable dealing with a Wacom tablet that I've always presented with my. So if you see me using a Wacom tablet, you know that I'm doing professional work. And if I'm using a mouse, you probably know that I'm teaching. I, I don't know why it's something in my head. But anyway, so with the shadows layer active, what you need to do is find, again, a dark shadow in the skin tone. So maybe like one of these darker colors here and let's see if that works. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go and paint in a shadow. By the way, I'm using hardness set to zero and I'm just gonna paint and see that I'm just painting my nice little shadow here. Beautiful little shadow. I'm like, um, what's his name? Bob Ross, is that his name? Like beautiful, happy little shadows. <laughs> and to make it even more realistic, you can change the blending mode to multiply. A blending mode is just crazy math behind the scenes that teaches, that teaches, that uh, helps you blend layer together. What I, the word, reason I said teaches is because it came to my mind that if you want to learn more about blending modes, um, you can go to my website, photoshoptrainingchannel.com, and I have this um, blending modes explained article. As, as you can see, it's got a lot of uh, shares and I go through each individual blending mode. There's a written, there's a video tutorial on it. And then all this stuff that I wrote about how each one of those blending modes works. And also if you forget about my name or website, if you just type in blending modes on Google, the first one is Adobe, then Wikipedia, and then me. So <laughs> I, I was unfortunate not to beat Wikipedia and, and Adobe, but the third one is me. So you can click on that and then check out the blending modes to see how they all work. So you can check them out. But anyway, so notice that with the normal blending mode, you, you get these um, non-realistic shadows. But if I change the blending mode to multiply, it just looks a little more realistic. See that? So now you would just try to paint in uh, the shadow setting here. I'm using the left and right bracket keys on the keyboard to adjust the brush size. And here we are, just painting those shadows in. Kenna told me I had time, so I'm taking my time now to apply these shadows, like so. And you know, this is all subjective. You don't have to follow the poster. You don't have to follow me. Like, Do it however you like, however it makes you happy. But you know, I was trying to follow the poster. And if you make a mistake like that, just undo and try again. Not a big deal. Actually, um, I just thought of something cool to show you guys. So in the, and I'll do it in a new, in a new document just so that it looks, actually this is like the second time I use this computer, which is why I don't have anything saved here yet. But anyway, in, in this new document, I'm just gonna create a new layer and I'm just gonna paint, right? So when you paint, and let me select a different brush so I can show you guys something cool. Um, I don't know which one will be a good one. This will probably work. Okay, this will probably work. So when you paint, right, you paint. And if you make a mistake and you want to erase, what most people do is go into the erase tool and then erase. But then notice now it, doesn't, it just doesn't look like it's part of the same brush, right? So what Adobe did recently is they added a way that when you paint, you can erase with the same brush. So if you hold the tilde key, that's the key to the left of the number one, you know, that little Enya thing right under the escape key. And you click and drag as you're holding that key, you erase with the same brush. See that? See that? And I know what some of you may be thinking like, oh, that's not fair. I have, you know, Photoshop CS6 or 5 or something. And I want to be able to do that. Well, if that's the case, if you have an older version of Photoshop that is not the latest release, you can actually sort of hack Photoshop so that it does the same thing. If you go into mode and select clear, right up here, clear, you can do the same thing. See that? Clear. So normal paints, change the blending mode to clear, and you can do the same thing. But in the latest, the latest and greatest release, all you have to do is hold the tilde key and do that. It's a little faster. So if you're in an older version, you can still do it. Just take some time to go in into the drop down, select and clear and coming back. But anyway, that was like a long winded explanation as to how you could erase if you make a mistake. Um, so for example, if you're creating 
a shadow here and then you just go overboard instead of undoing like i did earlier you can hold the um tilde key and then just erase like so so it's totally up to you how you do it but anyway i'm just going to continue painting see like i went too far into his nose there so i probably will come back there and use the tilde key to smooth that out so spend your time making these shadows so here we are we're going like so And I'll do one more right down here. And something else I wanted to show you is like, for example, if your image has a highlight like mine does there, that shadow doesn't look too realistic. And I'll even make it darker, even though I probably wouldn't like it darker, but just to prove a point. If you have a shadow, right? And then like the image down there has a highlight, it just looks weird. So in some ways it's almost better, better to keep the highlight. And what you can do is you can double click to the side of the layer and then use the blend if option. Blend if allows you to show or hide pixels based on their luminosity. So what I can do is tell Photoshop the underlying layer, so the layer that is below the one that is currently selected, I can click and drag to the left and see how it just hides the brightest pixels, but it looks terrible. So what you can do is hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and click to split those in half and create a smoother transition. See that, see? This is before and this is after so you can kind of fine tune it till, till you find something that that works like a happy medium totally up to you so this is an option that you have if you have like a really bad uh bad have highlight and it doesn't look correctly obviously this shadow looks terrible because i like over emphasize it to show the the technique oh here's another thing you can do so like in this case i want to just make that shadow not as intense what you can do is you can erase using the tilde key technique that i showed you and then you can use something super cool called fade. In Photoshop, if you go into edit and fade, um, you'll either adjust the opacity or blending, blending mode of the previous thing that you did. In this case, use the brush tool. So then I can fade the erase, uh, the brush stroke erase there. So I can just adjust how much of it I wanna erase, all of it or just a tiny little bit, totally up to you. So that's another, another way in which you can fine tune the shadows cool and then what you will do now is do the same thing create another layer control alt g command option g on the mac i'm not going to name it but that's also shadows and that is for the inside shapes so what you want to do is select that color and then just find like a really darker version of that and also change it to multiply and then just basically do the same thing try to figure out how the shadows would look in those inside shapes like so. Just take your time adjusting those shapes. Pretty cool stuff. Let me now move up to the new file or the file that's like next on the list. And I think is this one here, all shadows done. Cool. Actually, I think I could have probably done the whole thing without doing this whole cooking show thing. What we're gonna do now is try to make it seem as if there's like shadows and highlights affecting the image. And I wanna make it seem as if this face mask, those strips have some depth to them. So what you can do is go into this layer here, the one that's controlling the, the caps and the strips, double click to the side of it to create a layer style on them and you can just click on bevel and emboss and you can use like a yellowish color to create the highlights and this darker brown for the shadows and make sure that you have soften set to zero and you can adjust the size see that and what i'll do is um, i'll zoom in so that you can see what i'm doing so i'll zoom in then i'll go back in there and i can adjust the depth see that see how it now has an edge by the way, the highlight mode is on overlay and the shadow mode is on normal. And you can just adjust the intensity accordingly, whatever you think will work best for your image. So then that just makes it feel more like it's three dimensional. So something like that, and you can just adjust it any way that you want. When you're done, you can press OK. But then you're gonna think to yourself, hey man, yeah, but now we have these crazy lines going here and it doesn't really match the composite, you know, like what do we do? 
No problem. In Photoshop, you can actually take a layer style and turn it into a layer and then apply a layer mask to it. So that's what we'll do. You can right click on the FX icon and click on create layers. So once again, layer style icon, create layers that puts those layer styles into their own layers. See that? See the highlight there? That's the highlight. I'll zoom in. Highlight on this layer, shadow on this layer. Super cool. So now I can just add a layer mask here, a layer mask on the one on top. Let's work with the highlights first. So I'm in the highlight layer, which is this one here. And I can just come in there and paint with black to hide on my layer mask. With a layer mask, black reveals, white conceals. So I'm painting with black. I'm making sure that I'm hiding those pixels. If I want to bring back those pixels, then I can paint with white. So I'm just going to hide the highlights. And with the shadows, I can paint with black like so. And now I have total control of these highlights and shadows because they're, they're regular pixel layers, right? So what I can do is I can click on this icon here that locks the transparent pixels. So I can't create new pixels in that layer. I can only adjust the ones that are there, change the ones that are there. So I can come in here and with like the dodge tool, I can make like a highlight somewhere. Uh, is this the right layer? Yeah, so make a highlight, maybe even go there. So see that now, now it's a highlight or I can go there and make it even darker with the burn tool. So totally up to you how you can adjust this. You can also paint, right? If so, if you wanted to, you can just come in there and paint. See how I'm painting in there? Maybe select um, a darker color to just create stronger shadows in certain areas. See that? Or maybe instead of a shadow, I want to highlight there for whatever reason. I can do that as well. So complete control if you separate the layer style into its own layer. I didn't really want to do any of that. I'm just showing you that you have those options in case you need them in your project. Time for another time check, can I? Yeah, it's it's uh we've got about 15 minutes left, so okay, cool. you're good to go. Yeah. Sounds sounds good. So now the next thing that we need to do is create a curves adjustment layer and we're just going to apply a, a color style to the entire image. So I'm going to change the curves adjustment layer to luminosity because if I leave it at normal, watch what happens. I'm just going to create an extreme adjustment. Just make it really dark, see how overly saturated the reds are. Luminosity, not saturated, just darker, normal, super saturated. So that's why changing it to luminosity. And what I'm going to do is just make it a little bit darker, clicking and dragging this white point. The curves adjustment layer sort of works like a dimmer switch, you know, like in your house, you may have a dimmer switch. If you drag up, there's more light in the room. If you drag down, there's less light. So see, click on a point, drag up, more light, drag down, less light. And we're gonna talk about channels in a moment, but for now I'm just gonna click and drag this point down to just make it a little darker and maybe give it a little more contrast like that. And I'm going to create one more curves adjustment layer. And this one is gonna help us control the color. So I'm gonna go into the red channel, again, dragging up more light, dragging down less light. But with a channel, dragging up gives you more light in the channel that you're in and the red channel gives us red light. If we drag down, it'll give us less of that light and more of the opposite color of that channel. So the opposite of red is in the chat. Somebody's going to type it up, I'm sure. Cyan. Yes, I can't read the chat. Otherwise, I would have waited. Um, but I have the the point dragged down below that center line, so it makes it into cyan. With green, you obviously get green if you go up, and magenta if you go down. And with blue, you get blue going up and yellow going the other way. So now you can color grade this any way that you want, totally up to you. So in this case, maybe I'll just bring it down a little bit, bring the reds down to get a little cyan. The real poster, it has like a green, green tint to it. So I'm gonna click and drag up and give it some green in there, maybe not too much. And with the blues, I could probably maybe go down and, and just add a little bit of yellow just to get that, that color grade that it's, that's similar to the one in the original movie po or TV show poster. And one of the things that I'm not liking right now is his skin. His skin uh, is just looking too orange. And I think that the problem is because the original one here is just not my style of, of skin tone for this. So what I'll do is I'll just create a hue and saturation adjustment layer right on top of the faces images, but below the color grade. 
And I can just select reds because that's where you'll probably find the skin tones and just bring the saturation down a bit. And you can also shift the hues if you need to. So when I bring that back, you know, it looks a little bit better. It's too orange without it. And with it, that is probably a little too desaturated. So I'll bring back a little more saturation. It's, to my eye, it just seemed like it was too orange, but you know, you may like it. So before and after. What I'm gonna do now is click on the layer on top and press Control, Alt, Shift, E, Command, Option, Shift, E on the Mac, or you can smash your forehead up against the keyboard, and I'm sure you'll hit those keyboard shortcuts. Again, Control, Alt, Shift, E on Windows, Command, Option, Shift, E on the Mac, and that takes a basically a screenshot, so to speak, of everything that's in your in your pan, in your layers panel and puts it in a new layer. And the reason that I'm doing this is so that I could do some final adjustments to this without putting everything into a smart object. Um, I could have put everything into a, a smart object and do the same thing, but recently I've been working with larger files that putting everything into a smart object just seems crazy and it slows down my computer. So my workaround to that was that you could just create a smart object, a composite smart object out of one layer, and then with this smart object to apply the final effects. But then if you change your mind and want to change something like, so maybe I come in here, right? And then I decide, you know what? Maybe I want to make, you know, maybe I do want that overly saturated orange on his skin, right? I changed my mind. I can just do another one of those screenshots, Control, Alt, Shift, E, Command, Option, Shift, E on the Mac. And then I can place that in here. And I don't even need to do that, actually. What I, what I really need to do is press Control, A to select all, copy, merge, and then open this smart object. And I can just paste that in there. And then that's what we'll use for the final um, final composite. But anyway, that's just why I did this in case you were wondering why I didn't put everything into a smart object. So with my final adjustment layer, what I'm gonna do is go into filter, camera raw filter, and I'm just gonna apply some camera raw adjustments. Maybe I can add just a tiny bit more green in the tint, add a little bit more contrast, maybe brighten up the shadows a little bit and reduce the highlights to give them more detail in the highlights. Texture just makes the texture pop. Clarity is contrast and edge pixels. Vibrance is smart saturation. It protects already saturated pixels and skin tones. Maybe a little more. <clears throat> now I'm gonna zoom in to the 100% view and go into the sharpening. When you apply sharpening, you wanna be at 100% because any other view would be misleading. So you really wanna see what you're doing. And I'm just gonna increase the sharpening, right? And when you sharpen something, you obviously can see what's going on, but if you really wanna be smart about your sharpening, what you should do is hold the Alt key on Windows, the Option key on the Mac, and click on the masking slider. This is just a mask, right? So white reveals, black conceals. Everything is white, so the effect is applied to the entire image. But if I drag to the right, Photoshop starts finding the edges, and notice how the background disappears. So now there is no sharpening effect applied to the background, which is exactly what I want. So then I'll release here, and that will give me a better sharpening effect to my subject without sharpening the background. And what I'll do is I'll right-click, fit in view, go into the effects tab, and add a little bit of a vignette. I think the original movie poster or TV show poster had a vignette. And uh, those of you that know me know that I like grain, so I'm gonna add a little tiny bit of grain, this, just, just a hint. Go into the 100% view, fit on view, and press OK. So let me just compare that to the one that I spent a little more time without talking, but it looks, looks very similar. <laughs> I actually like the colors on this one better. I, I spent more time. This one's too saturated, too orange, but that's what I mean. You need to spend some time fine tuning the adjustment layers that you make. Obviously, when you're talking and trying to be creative, it's a little bit more difficult, but I think it came out close enough and you guys got the idea of how this particular technique works. I think we're good with time, right? Absolutely. Look at that. Under an hour recreating the uh, movie poster or the TV show poster TV show for poster, yeah. the hit show Prodigal Son, yeah. which again, I hadn't watched either. But when I went and looked at it, I, it looks like it has kind of like a cultish following. So okay. we'll get, cool. check and it out. A really cool poster. So I'm glad we got a chance to recreate it. Again, um, this is part of my Copycat Wednesday series on my YouTube channel. You can see it that I did a flash one, the Lightroom splash screen and the perfume movie poster, which again, I hadn't seen, but somebody recommended the movie poster to me. So I, I made it. So in the chat, somebody will let us know if it's good or not. 
make sure that if you do come into my YouTube channel, you click on the subscribe button, the notification button. If you're already subscribed, thank you so much. I appreciate the subscriptions. Also, Instagram, JR from PTC. My website, this is where you can find that blending mode tutorial that I talked about. Awesome, Jesus. Thank you so much for coming on and doing this. You know, it's like you said in the beginning, it's one thing to watch a tutorial. It's another thing to see somebody create something from right. start to finish. Um, so such a great uh, way to learn. I just want to give you a couple of comments. Uh, Lisa Carney says, you did an amazing job. Oh, and thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa, who is another instructor here on Creative Live yeah. for tuning in the whole time and Carla Rossi says no matter what Jesus teaches I go away with so much new knowledge tips and tricks and inspiration so good at what he does thank you Jesus awesome thank and you thank you Carla for tuning in and everybody you can check out what is coming up on creativelive.com slash tv if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter right now you can head over and see the upcoming schedule you can mm -hmm. also give us suggestions on what you want to see again creative live tv is all about entertaining and inspiring and connecting us all together um, so we're super happy to to have that for you and like jesus said he's got over a million subscribers on youtube and mm -hmm. so clearly he's doing something right uh, so jesus thank you again any final parting words for everyone yeah, one thing actually, I want to encourage everybody to try this out. And if you try it out, make sure that you use the hashtag PTC vids, because I often check for that hashtag to see what you guys do. So I, I love to see that people are creating with something I'm doing. Um, a, a like and a comment is great, but when I actually see like something that somebody made, I'm like, oh wow, that's that's super cool. So make sure that you either tag me or use that hashtag. It'd be cool to see the work that you guys do. That's perfect. And also, I know you, like you said, you take suggestions from the community yes. for upcoming uh, Copycat Wednesday. So where should people do that? Yeah, so a place that I really want to make it like the official place to leave your, your suggestions should be a Copycat Wednesday video. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. A big thank you to Jesus Ramirez. And we will see you all next time here on Creative Live. Bye, Jesus. Thank awesome. you. Thank you, Kenna. Bye, guys.